that's not fortified, some, somebody that is not protected. Prayer protects you. Prayer puts a cover. Prayer puts a wall around you. The devil is not able to attack you when you're praying because there is a cover that normally comes upon you. There's a car, there is a cover that comes around you when you pray. When you pray. So, lack of prayer gives the devil the space to attack you. One time, Herod, the king, took James and killed him. James was one of the apostles. He took James and killed him. And then proceeded and took Peter. Peter was the bishop. Peter was the pastor. The, 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 the senior pastor in that church. The first church. So after he took James and nobody did anything. The church kept quiet. You remember, uh, you remember uh, David saying that when I kept quiet, that is Proverbs, uh, not Proverbs, Psalms 39 verse 2. He says, when I kept quiet, when I kept quiet, my pain increased, my anguish increased. My situation became worse. My situation grew worse because I kept quiet. So, when the devil took Peter, or rather James, the church kept quiet and because of that silence they did not pray because of that silence because of that prayerlessness the devil took advantage the devil entered even further the devil saw an opportunity to attack them and he did very well he did very well he took Peter and he was about to slay him he was about to behead him but Thank God the church realized what they were missing and they gathered together and they started praying. And the Bible says, but prayer were made by the church. That is Acts chapter 12 verse 5. But prayer was made. Prayer. Prayer was made. But prayer was made. But prayer was made without ceasing by the church unto God. And that is when Peter, that is when Peter was rescued. When prayer was made, Peter was rescued. When prayer was made, Peter was rescued. The space that they had given the devil, the opportunity, the chance that they had given the devil, that chance was taken away. That chance was taken away you know hallelujah i say hallelujah mm. Mm. It's, it's it's very 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 important very 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 important it's very 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 important so uh, understand this christianity is a battlefield if you don't fight you will be fought Christianity is a battlefield. You either kill or you are killed. You either kill or you get killed. The devil you don't kill today will kill you tomorrow. So that's why you have to really be vigilant. And that's why you have to be merciless. That's why you have to be ruthless. That's why you have to be a fighter. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter what? Chapter, chapter, chapter what? Chapter six, chapter six, chapter six, from verse twelve, the Bible says that put the full armor, the whole armor. Put the whole armor. You see, Ephesians chapter six, from verse twelve, then. You go to verse 14 and it talks about prayer. So that you can be able to stand. Prayer. Prayer is what will help you to stand. Prayer is what will help you to do what? To stand. Prayer. 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 Prayer 
is what will help you to stand. Prayer mm, is one of the weapons that you need to have. Verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Very, very important. Very, very important. Very, very important. Glory to God. I say glory to Jesus. Mm -mm. Mm. Mm. Somebody say I will pray. Number three. Lack of prayer will make a believer to suffocate. I said that already. Prayer to a believer is what water is to the fish. Prayer to a believer is what water is to the fish. Without prayer, the fish will suffocate. A believer will suffocate in this world if he lacks prayer. You cannot survive in this wicked world without prayer. So prayer is your safe safe place. Prayer is your safe place. Matthew 26 41 Watch and pray that you enter into that you enter not into temptation. Pray and watch. Watch and pray. That is Jesus talking to Peter. Watch and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. And you know after a few minutes he entered. After a few hours, he entered into that temptation because instead of praying and watching, instead of cashering, instead of staying awake, they decided to sleep. They decided to sleep. And Jesus came three times. Three times. Three times asking them, can't you stay with me at least for one hour? So Jesus went and prayed for three hours. Then, they were just sleeping. May the Lord give you the grace. I say may the Lord give you the grace. Catalysts for prayer. What motivates prayer? What motivates prayer? What makes you become prayer driven? What makes you become prayer driven? A prayer driven Christian, a prayer driven minister, a prayer driven believer. What drives your urge for prayer? What catalyzes your urge for prayer? What motivates your drive for prayer? Number one, desire to see change. When somebody has a desire to see change, they will pray. When somebody has a desire to see change, they will pray. They will pray. They will pray. When you really want to be anointed, you will pray. When you want to see revival, you will pray. When you want to see change in your life, you will pray. I think the reason why many Christians don't pray, it is because they are okay where they are. They are okay the way they are. They are okay. The reason why pastors don't pray is because they are okay. But if you are not okay with the people you have, you are not okay with the level of your church, you are not okay of where you are ministerially, if you are not okay where you are financially, you are not okay where you are maritally, you are not okay where you are, then you will do something about it. You will pray. Desire to see change. When somebody has a vision, when somebody has a dream to see change, they will not sit down and fold their hands. They will wake up and they will pray. They will wake up and they will pray. They will wake up and they will pray. There is somebody called John Knox of Scotland. 
he prayed to God that he told God, give me Scotland or I die. Give me Scotland or I die. You see, that's a man who had a desire, a hunger to see change. He wanted to see change in his nation. He wanted God to use him. He prayed. He told God, if you don't give me this land, if you don't give me this nation, I will die. Take me. If you don't give me Kenya, take me. If you don't give me Scotland, take me. He was ready to die if things are not going to change. He was ready to die if he will not see God in his life. So, the desire to see change will drive you to a place of prayer. It will motivate you to pray. It will motivate you to pray. List down the things that are wrong in your life and see if you will not pray. List down the things that are wrong and be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself and tell yourself the truth. List down everything you think is not correct in your life. Starting with your age. Starting with your age. And see where you are supposed to be at this time. And see whether you will not pray. You will pray when you realize that something is wrong in your life. You will pray when you realize that where you are is not where you are supposed to be. You will pray. You will pray. This is something that will motivate you. This is something that will challenge you to pray. People stop praying because they are comfortable. They, they feel comfortable where they are. They are okay with their status quo. I want you to I want you to I want you to to challenge yourself. I want you to be realistic. I want you to be honest. See how things are not okay in your life. Things are not okay in your life. You're not where you're supposed to be. You're not where you're supposed to be. You may be doing very well, but you're not where you're supposed to be. There is always another level. There is always a higher level in life. Yeah. The greatest enemy of your success is your current success. If you want to succeed further, then you need to stop celebrating your success. Your success today is failure tomorrow. Your success today is mediocrity tomorrow. Celebrate success now. And start planning for, eh, for the future. Start planning for the future. Don't over-celebrate. It's okay to celebrate. But don't over-celebrate. Don't over-celebrate. Yes. To be fast doesn't mean that you... Eh, that you are the best. You can be fast but not the best. Hallelujah. You can be fast but not the best. You can be the first one who arrived here. But that doesn't mean that you are the best. You can be the first one to have a business in your, in your family. But that doesn't mean that you are the best. There are other people who are better than you. You can be the first one to have a degree to graduate in your family. But that doesn't mean that you are the best. It is only in your family that you are the best. You are the best only in your family, but not in the world. And then again, there are other things that you can do that can make you better. So stop over-celebrating. Stop over-celebrating. Go for, for what is best. Go for what is best. There is no graduation in the school of knowledge and in the school of growth, in the school of progress. Somebody will grow here in Jesus' name. Amen. Pray. John Knox said, no, we cannot continue like this. God, give me Scotland. Give me the people of this nation. Give me souls. In this nation. 
or I die. My church cannot continue to be the way it is. You either change my church or I die. Eh, yes. You either change the way things are or I, you see me there. You will see me there. I will come. <laughs> I'm reminded of A.A. Uh, a. Allen. There was a man of God that was called A.A. A. Allen. And one time he prayed. He locked himself in a house, in a room to pray. Uh, but then after a few hours, he left. Not even after a few after a few minutes, he left the room and went looking for something to eat. He did that several, several years. He would say, I will pray, I will pray. So he would lock himself in a room. But then after a few hours, he would leave the room and continue with life and continue with mis uh, miserable, his miserable life and continue with mediocrity. But one day he got tired. One day he got tired. And he told his wife, I want you to lock me inside this room and take the keys and do not open for me. And then the wife was very obedient. <laughs> he told the wife, don't open for me until I tell you I have seen God. Until I tell you God has come, don't open. And the wife was very obedient. You need to marry an obedient wife. Amen. So the wife locked him in the room. And then after, just like usual, <laughs> he, after several hours he wanted to come out because of the, uh, <laughs> because of hunger. And then the wife asked, asked him, has God come? No, but I will come back later to continue. The wife said, no, you told me... <laughs> <laughs> she told him stay there until you tell me God has come I will not open the, this house I will not open this door and he stayed there until God came praise God hmm. when you get tired of mediocrity you will pray when you get tired of you know rotating at one place hmm Rotating at one, at one place. You will pray. May the spirit of prayer come to you. Desire to see change. So John Knox prayed. Give me Scotland. Or I die. And then one time. He prayed until one time. The queen of Scotland said. That I fear the prayer of John Knox. More than the armies of England. Can you imagine that? I fear the prayers of John Knox more than the armies of England. That is how much he prayed. His prayer was so powerful. So powerful. So powerful. Hmm? Glory to God. I'm reminded of uh, uh, this man called Charles Finney. Charles Finney would organize a crusade like if he would organize a crusade in Kenya. There is this man that was his personal intercessor. He would send that man where he wanted to hold a crusade for, for weeks before. He would go there for four weeks before the time of, uh, of crusade. And he would stay there praying in the, in the hotel. He would lock himself inside the hotel and pray and fast for four weeks prior to the, to the crusade. And that is how they were able to, to bring masses into the kingdom of God. Desire for change. May you receive the ability to pray. May the Lord give you a desire, a desire, a burning desire for change. Yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody like Elijah. Elijah prayed that there will be no rain because he had seen the way people were behaving. And he said, Mutaniona, Mutaona Munguangu, there will be no rain. There will be no rain because of the way you are behaving, the way you have, you know, you have behaved before God. There will be no rain in this land. And he prayed. The Bible says that he prayed earnestly. James chapter 5, verse 17. He prayed earnestly. He prayed earnestly. 
Elijah prayed earnestly. He did not just say there will be no rain. You know, when you go to uh, the book of Kings, you think that uh, he just prayed. He just said, let there be no rain. No, he did not say let there be no rain. He prayed earnestly. He prayed earnestly that there will be no rain. And for a period of three and a half years, there was no rain in Israel. There was no rain in Israel in a period of three and a half years. Hallelujah. The Bible says, verse 18 of James chapter 5, uh, the Bible says that Elijah was a man of like passion. He was just like us. He was a man of like passion. He was just like us. 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 He was just like us, but he prayed. He was like you, but he prayed. James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Verse eight, 17 and 18. Verse 17 says that he was just like us. He was a man of like passion. And then verse 18 is the one that talks about how he prayed earnestly. He prayed earnestly that there will be no rain. That there will be no rain. That there will be no rain. And it happened. Hallelujah. Mm. Desire for change. Hunger for change. Mm. Are you tired of being employed? Then pray. Are you tired of being a slave? Then pray. Are you tired of things not working? Then pray. Are you tired of your career not working? Then pray. Are you tired that things are not happening in your life? Then pray. Are you tired of where your ministry is? Then pray. Then pray. Come to church and pray. Don't whine. Don't stay there crying and complaining. Hmm? Complaining. Don't complain. Pray. Number two, hunger for God. Hunger for God. So number one, catalyst for prayer or motivation for prayer is change. Desire for change. Desire to see change. And then number two, hunger for God. Hunger for God. When you want to see God in your life. When you really, when you love God so much. When people love God so much, they pray a lot. Your love for God is, a di is directly proportional to your level of love. Your level of love. Your level of life. Mm. Your level of love. Your level of love. Your level of love. The more you love God, the more you will pray. The more you will be hungry for him. The more you love God, the more you will be hungry for him. Hunger for God. Hunger for God. Number three. The zeal for kingdom advancement. The zeal to see the kingdom of God advancing. The zeal, the desire to see the kingdom of God advancing. I don't know what is your vision in this life. For some of us, we don't have a vision. We don't have a place for God in our vision. If you put down, if you write down your vision and you put, you write down the, the list of things that you desire. I don't know where God comes in. I don't know whether God appears. I don't know whether God features anywhere. In the list of your desires. In the list of your desires. I pray. That our first desire will be God. Our first desire will be. To see the kingdom of God advancing. Even if you are not a full time minister. Even if you are not a full time minister. Let there be a desire to see the kingdom of God advancing in your heart. Let there be a desire in your heart to see the work of God advancing, even if you are not a pastor. Mm. For pastor is supposed to be another level. For you, 
a lay a layman, a lay believer, just a believer. For you, you are supposed to have God is supposed to feature at least somewhere number one, somewhere in your in your list of desires. Amen. For the pastor, it's another level. For the pastor, it's supposed to be the main desire. The main, the main desire. The main desire for a pastor is to see the kingdom of God advancing. But as for you, it's supposed to be part of what you desire. Part of the things that you desire. One of the things that you desire. And it's supposed to be the top one. The first one. Glory to God. Now it's a shame that you are a pastor but you, you don't have zeal for the kingdom of God. It's not even a shame. It just proves that you are not a pastor. It just proves that you are not anywhere called. You did not even hear an echo. Leave alone the voice. You did not even hear an echo. You are very far. You, even an echo did not come to your ears because you are very far from God. You know you cannot be called if you are not he, near God. You understand that. Eh? Let me not digress. So, <laughs> what, I'm not, what I'm talking about here is not for pastors. It's for believers. Zeal for what? For kingdom advancement. Kingdom advancement. Nehemiah was not a pastor. He was not a priest. He was not anywhere. He was not anywhere in the in that in that portfolio. But you know what? He had a desire to see the kingdom of God advance. He was employed. He was employed. He was employed. He was working in the palace for the for a king. He was working. He was working. He was a butler. He was one of the butlers. But he has a, he had a desire. So even if even if you are a, you are a, you are you are not a full time minister, you work, you employed, you do your business. You are a business person. You still need to have a desire to see the kingdom of God advancing. Hallelujah. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 2. The Bible says from verse 2 to 5. So the king said to me this is Nehemiah talking. Why do you look sad? Imagine he was sad and he was not a pastor. He was sad because the <laughs> because Jerusalem the wall of Jerusalem was in ruin. Hmm? The house of God was in ruin. The fence of the church was in ruin. And because of that, this man, an official in the government, a government official, is very sad. Very sad. Until people are noticing. When do you get sad? Hmm? When do you get sad? When your wife is not talking to you. When your husband is not talking to you. That's when you get sad. Now this man was sad because <laughs> The fence in the church was not was not, was in ruin. Can you imagine that? <laughs> hmm? Why do you look sad since you are not eh, since you are not sick? Since you are not sick, why are you? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. He responds. He responded. Then I, I was very much afraid, and I said to the king. Let the king live forever. Even him, it is surprised him to see the king noticing that he was sad because of the house of God. So he was very afraid. Why should I not be sad? Hmm? Uh, when, why should I not be sad faced when the city, the place of my father's uh, sepulchre, lies waste and is fortified, gates are consumed by fire? The king said to me, for what do you ask then? What do you want? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to him, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you will send me to Judah, 
to the city of my father's uh, sipaka that I may rebuild it. Look at his prayer. He's praying earnestly. Not because of his business. Not because of his family. Not because of anything personal. But because of the work of God. Because of the work of God. So that the kingdom of God can advance. So that the church can be built. Have you ever fasted because of this church? Have you ever fasted because of the projects in church? Now this man is fasting and praying because of the projects in the church. Because of the projects of God. Not because of his personal project. Mm. Have you ever been sad that the church has no people? And you decided to fast for one week because of the church. So that by Sunday when you come to, to church, you will find people in church. Have you ever fasted because of that? Have you ever prayed? Have you ever took time to pray because of the church? This man was a government official, but he was praying. He was consumed with the zeal for kingdom advancement. Number four, the last one for now, total dependence on God. These are motivations. These are the drives. Things that drive us into the presence of God. Things that make us to wake up and pray. Oh God, Father, may you help us. That <laughs> you must have total dependence on God. Or rather, when you have total dependence on God, when you are self-aware, when you are self-aware, when you have self-awareness, when you have self-awareness, when you have self-awareness, that you can do nothing without God, that you are nothing without God, that you can do nothing without God, that you need God to be able to perform, that you need God to be able to live, that you need God. It takes faith. It takes a lot of faith, a lot of trust, trusting in God for you to be able to pray. A believer will pray because they know only God can help them. Only God has their help. A believer, a minister will pray because he knows only God has their help. I pray because I know without God, even if you fill this church, without God, I am done. Even, the, even if the church was full, without like today i was i was telling god god i know that you want to bring so many people here but make me ready <laughs> help me to be ready help me to be ready help me to be ready yeah help me to be ready i am not ready if god is not with me i can have so many degrees but i'm not ready if god is not with me I can go to all the logical schools, all biblical schools, all biblical knowledge, uh, or rather uh, uh, colleges, and I will still not be ready if God is not with me. I am ready when God is with me. I am ready when God is with me. I am not ready if God is not with me. I am ready only when God is with me. I am ready only when God is with me. Only when God is with me. Hallelujah. So a minister who depends on God, a minister who knows that his help can only come from God, will pray like David. Where will my help come from? Psalms 121 verse 1. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. That is where my help come from. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade. Upon thy right hand the sun shall not smite thee by the day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in. From this time forth and even forevermore. So when you realize that God is the one who protects you and keeps you and helps you. Either in your ministry be it, in your family be it, uh, your career. You know you are 
whatever it is that you do then you will pray the moment you realize that you need God that you need the help of God you will pray but proud people cannot pray only humble people can pray only people who depend on God can pray and that's why the Bible says that uh, he gives grace to the humble because only the humble will humble themselves only the humble will go to God only the humble will go seeking God yeah. people who don't pray they feel proud, they are proud if you don't pray then it means that some seed of, of pride is, is actually is actually coming to you is actually growing some seed of pride is growing Hallelujah. So awareness that only God has your help will take you to the altar of prayer. To the altar of prayer. To the altar of prayer. Psalms 54 verse 4. When you discover that you need God, you will pray. The Bible says, Behold, God is mine helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. You know? You know? When you realize that God is your helper, then you will pray. You will pray. 